Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 9A of our Residential Technology course. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at interior finishes. This is really based on Chapter 13 of the Understanding Construction Drawings textbook. Uh, so we're going to be looking at interior finishes and kitchens. We'll be in 9B actually looking at uh, stairs as well. So this, that's in the overall objectives that we'll be looking at. But what I really want you to do today is to try to get an understanding of some of the interior finishes that go on the house. Um, we've looked at the construction of a house from the footings through the foundations, the framing, and the exterior finishes, the building systems, the building envelope. And so now we're looking at closing in the house and putting on the interior finishes. Um, so um, when we've enclosed our houses, we typically will use a gypsum wall board, also better known as drywall. And um, there's different thicknesses of drywall. There's quite a few different uh, types of drywall to um, serve different uh, purposes. So, you know, you can have thinner drywall that would be used for curved walls, and then it's usually put on double layers so they make up a half an inch thickness. Uh, you have half inch, which is your typical thickness that's most commonly used. Um, you have five eighths inch uh, drywall for where you have um, a wider uh, on center spacing. Like if your roof trusses are 24 inches, um, you typically use a five eighths drywall, although they've got a half inch reinforced type drywall that can actually span 24 inches as well. Um, type X is a fire resistant um, type um, drywall that will um, reduce the spread of fly fire through the wall. It takes longer for a fire to go through it. Uh, so if you, if your house, depending on the proximity um, and limiting distance requirements in the building code, uh, you may have to put a type X drywall along one of the walls. And there's many other reasons why you may have to put a fire resistant um, drywall on the code related um, reasons. Um, there can be exterior sheathing that's made out of gypsum, a dense glass gold. Um, there's different products that are um, utilized, but they have to be moisture uh, resistant. And there's also a um, mold resistant drywall, which kind of has a um, fiberglass mat instead of paper. One of the issues we have with uh, mold is if there's moisture in a particular area, um, and it basically the drywall gets wet, uh, the paper on the drywall is very conducive to mold growth. So um, you don't want to have drywall in a damp um, location uh, that potentially could um, develop mold. So, so there are different specialty products like mold resistant drywall. Uh, depending on a basement, if it's really kind of um, damp, it might be a consideration bathroom might be a consideration. Uh, there's also moisture resistant drywall that can be used. It shouldn't be used in a shower area, but it can be used in a bathroom where you'd have steam and that sort of thing going on um, to help um, reduce those kind of impacts. So using the right, um, the right uh, drywall for the right purpose is important. Um, so yeah, um, when we look at a, a wall section, uh, you, you really are looking at a lot of things. So this um, detail section of the wall here uh, is uh, showing a lot of information. You see the hexagon symbol. I don't know why I've got it there in the middle of the page, but anyways, the hexagon symbol number three would be pointing to the construction notes. And then this pretty much spells the construction notes from the outside wall through the interior. So you can really kind of walk it through. The hatching here is for a brick veneer. We see the hatching for insulation that we've talked about in previous lectures. And so it's telling us, um, it also tells us two by six stud walls, typical, um, and face brick, one inch airspace. So it'd be an airspace between the brick, it tells us the metal ties. Um, it tells us the building paper, exterior type sheathing. It doesn't specify the sheathing, the two by six studs. Uh, the bad insulation in between, the air vapor barrier, that plastic polyethylene that we looked at in previous lectures, uh, half inch interior drywall, there we go, half inch interior drywall. So it's telling us what the material is. And then at the end, it's adding some notes about things like weeping weep holes are gonna be 
at um, 30 inches on center. That's the spaces in the brick on the bottom course over window openings and talking about a base flashing. But really up to this point where it gets underlined is just discussing the wall from the outside to the inside and we're ending up with a drywall on the inside. So just half inch drywall finish on the inside. This is showing in a shower. Uh, so uh, in a shower, this is showing in a production home. I think this is actually the Doncaster house by the look of it because there's a half wall here, toilet over here by the look of the water supply line. Uh, you've got um, drywall on the outside and then you've got a um, cement board, which is a half inch thick material that is a mixture of cement. It's got a little bit of styrofoam mixed in it to make it a little bit lighter so it's not as heavy. Uh, and it's got a fiberglass uh, mesh that's uh, wrapping it so that it um, holds together. The fiberglass holds it together. And all of that is very, very water resistant. Uh, so this is uh, making up what we would call the substrate for the shower. So you wouldn't want to have drywall as the substrate for the shower because moisture will get through the tile joints. It'll make the drywall damp. It'll become mushy and then it'll just drop the tile. Uh, you wouldn't want to put water resistant drywall because it's water resistant, it's not waterproof. Um, so that would also uh, get moisture, although they did for many years put moisture resistant drywall in a shower, but usually after about nine or 10 years of use, um, your shower is done. Uh, so this is a, a much better material, but there's even better materials out there too. So there's a, a bunch of different products that are out there. Um, from that per, from that point of view, um, but this is a very durable uh, material. They don't have it down here because the cement board doesn't get hit directly with the shower because the shower head will be probably somewhere coming out here. I would have put it there, but uh, you know, economies drywall is a lot uh, less expensive. I would at least put a moisture resistant drywall there. Um, uh, other than that, uh, that's um, and you can sort of see that the plastic um, base that is there for um, the base which will have a dry pack concrete that'll be filled in there and it'll be sloping to the drain and then ceramic tile will go on top of that have to be very careful though during this time period that's why they got these pieces in there if you stand in there you don't want to accidentally stand on a nail or a screw it'll cut the membrane and then it will leak so drywall is put on and we put on drywall. Pretty much this is a pretty good illustration I find. Uh, so they call it, you know, they'll, they'll call the, the drywallers lathers, but basically, you know, you're putting on the drywall. Drywall comes in sheets of four by eight, four by 10, four by 12. Uh, you can even get longer sheets sometimes, um, but those are the, the typical ones, four by eight, four by 10, four by 12. And you can even get them wider, four foot six. And I believe you can even get five foot wide now for the 10 foot ceilings and the nine foot ceilings. Um, so that means you could put it horizontally um, across the back. And uh, if it's uh, four foot six and four foot six, that would make for a nine foot ceiling. Um, so that's um, where that comes in. Usually there's a, an adjustment for the uh, walls with the pre-cut stud so it'd probably be at about nine foot one your ceiling but by the time you put the drywall in the ceiling you've got a little bit of space on the bottom so we have our taping compound that then uh, is put into the joint these joints are usually either rounded or recessed the recess looks like that the rounded just kind of the end just kind of tapers in a little bit and that's so that when you put the taping compound and the tape and the tape is just it's not sticky, it's just a roll of paper and it's got a crease in it. And you embed the paper in the mud taping compound. Mud's probably not the best name, but it's what they, the, the tapers like to call it. The taping compound. So you put the tape in that and then that embeds itself and that stops that from cracking, right? So if you didn't put the tape there, this would crack every time. And then there's another coat of joint compound that is spread over that, but only after this dries. So that dries. Then there's another coat and it's feathered out. So it's getting thinner as it goes wider. And the same thing goes on with the next coat. It goes thinner and wider. So you don't see a hump where the tape is. That's the important thing. So it looks like it's smooth when it's finished. Uh, that's the struggle you have with drywall is trying to make it look perfectly smooth when it's finished, especially when it's end joints because the end joints aren't tapered, just the edge joints are tapered. 
And so it's, a, you know, you've got one coat, two coats, three coats, and there's a sanding that goes on at the end. And if you're a really good taper, the sanding is not a ton of work. It means that it just requires just a little bit of smoothing out. Um, if you're not very good at taping, it requires a lot of smoothing out and it's not a good job. Um, so somebody can appreciate it who's tried the tape uh, and uh, you get an appreciation for some of the skills that are required with that. But a really uh, good taper can tape pretty quickly um, a house and then they just do three coats and then they do a light sanding overall. On an outside corner, they'll put a metal corner bead and on an inside corner, this tape has actually a crease in the middle that you just have to bend and it will um, go into an inside corner the same way this is being done. Joint compound that's used, there's a variety of different compounds. Um, typically, uh, like where it's being put on thick, they'll usually, because of maybe a corner bead or something of that nature, they'll usually put uh, a material they call Durapon 90. And the thing with Durapon 90, because it's thick, it dries in 90 minutes. If you hear Durabon 45, it dries in 45 minutes. Taping compound usually takes at least overnight to dry. Um, and if you put it on thick, it takes longer. So that's why usually if it's uh, in an area where you've got to do a fair bit of filling in that, the taper will do a pre-fill with some Durabon uh, 90. So it sets up pretty quick. So it's following that um, process. So you can sort of see here the drywall, the joints are always, the end joints are always staggered. It's what we call a butt joint. This has got the rounded edges and the tape would go over there and you can see a little bit of the indentation along there. And so that's easier to fill. This one you got to taper out even wider. So you got to really feather it out, feather it out wider so you don't see a hump because, you know, it, with the lighting just right when that gets painted, if that hasn't been feathered out enough, then you would tend to see a hump on it. And so this would be an outside corner. So you see that on the outside corners, this is metal bead and this little bead sticks out a little bit further than the metal here. So that you spread that uh, taping compound out wider on the corner, right? So it feathers that out. And so you see the bulkhead, it would have metal coming down here, metal coming around there, metal going down here and around like so and that's a bulkhead which is for the kitchen cabinets you see over the screws it's usually faster to just go straight where this is where every stud is they'll just take their um, taping knife they call it a knife and they just go sideways it's not a knife it's uh, basically a spatula almost like it just goes down sideways and it covers the screws in one shot and they have to cover it several times because every time the taping compound um, dries it shrinks and so you have to fill the nail or the screw and then it shrinks a little and then you fill it again and then it shrinks a little bit less and then you fill it again and then it's like smooth um, so uh, that's what um, goes on with the taping compound so that's why we have to put multiple um, coats uh, over it and we generally will nail the outside corners and we will screw the drywall so uh, screws hold much better than drywall nails and you have to actually double up the nails if you're using drywall nails um, by building code. So you typically will use drywall screws. There's a special screw gun. It's got to stop and you just push it in and it needs to be, the screws need to just indent where the screw goes in but not go deep enough to cut the paper because if it cuts the paper it loses its strength because then the screw is just into the gypsum and the gypsum just crumbles. So it's actually that paper and the edge of the screw that holds the drywall in place. And we've talked about shrinkage and things of that nature. That's another reason why screws are better um, than nails. But around uh, edges, sometimes they will have some nails just to hold the drywall in until they can go around and put the screws. And on the metal, they put the nails because the screw head would stick up too much. And then when they put the taping compound, you'd see the, the edge of the screw through the um, taping compound. So that is a consideration. Somebody that's used to installing drywall, I used to do a fair bit of it myself. So uh, I'm reasonably good at that. Um, will have their screw gun set just right and be used to using it. And they'll just push it in and then I'll just leave the right indentation. And for some reason, it didn't go in as well as they wanted. They have their hammer and they just give it a quick um, shot.
just to um, just to make it sure it's below the surface. Because if it's slightly above, when you run the taping compound over, it leaves a, a bump, right? So that has to be slightly indented. So very, very important process uh, to the job. Generally, what you want to do is very often, like in production, what they will do is they will have the taper um, put the prime coat on because you really can't tell how good this is with the different colors, like between the white and the drywall and this. You really only see it when the prime coat, like a white primer is placed on it. And then you'll see if there's waves or if you can see humps in the drywall. And if you do, then the taper has to come back and feather it out more so that you don't see it so much. Uh, so that's generally from a contract point of view, the primer goes on, the taper type takes a good look if they have anything to do with that. And if we're talking lean principles, the best thing is actually to have the painter inspect. Is this good for me to put the paint on? Because the painter shouldn't have to do a lot of filling, a few little minor spots, but not a lot of uh, filling. So you kind of make that person um, responsible for accepting the work. It's kind of a good kind of scenario. If they don't like it, tell the taper to come back and fix it. Plus you look at it yourself. Um, millwork and trim. So we've got the doors. Uh, with millwork, when you hear millwork, that's any cabinetry, right? So that's any kind of cabinetry. It could be bookshelves, it could be vanities, it could be the kitchen cabinetry. That's all part of the overarching millwork area, right? And trim is your casing and your crown mold and your baseboards, all of those types of materials. Windows come into millwork. Um, casing, as I mentioned, and baseboard. Uh, crown molds, built-in cabinetry, wall paneling, you know, with raised panels and different things like that. That all comes into play. There's all kinds of different molding. This is just a quick short list here. If you want, you go check a, um, a millwork uh, place online. You can see a lot of different profiles for different moldings. Some uh, millwork places, they'll have like 20 different types of uh, baseboard that you can choose from. Uh, and you know a lot wider than that, maybe uh, 10 inches wide or more, uh, some of the fancy different uh, profiles that you can find. Probably in Toronto, a good one to look at is Central Fairbank um, Lumber. Uh, they used to have a lot of different uh, profiles and even in different types of species of wood, like uh, oak and um, maple sometimes. And uh, they always had white wood, which is like a birch material, which is paint grade. And now, of course, they have other materials like MDF, medium density fiber board. It's not even a wood, but it paints pretty well. And the uh, average person looking at it once it's painted, you really can't um, notice the difference uh, in some ways, unfortunately. But yeah, um, so that's um, some of the some of the difference. The brick mold goes on the outside of like a wood window um, to the brick. Uh, chair rail, maybe about halfway up the wall. And they call it chair rail so that a chair you know, when it hits the wall, um, doesn't damage the wall. This is basically a sill for a window, rabbited stool. The rabbit is this part here. Uh, door stop, um, drip cap for the outside or over top of a door outside. These could be a different moldings that could be used on the walls. Uh, astrical is between a French door. This is the old style where it goes in between. Another one could be just where it's cut off through there and it goes across. These are kind of like types of uh, crowns and molds and casings. Casings go around doors and windows. So um, you can see some finishes here. You can see the drywall. You can see a bulkhead over here. Uh, in this case, to conceal heating ducts. Uh, this is a crown mold um, that's been installed. And um, this is flat arch that we've been seeing on drawings, separate the room. And this is a stippo ceiling, often called a popcorn ceiling. Production builders tend to like this because if we go back a few slides, um, they can get away with a little bit more imperfections in the ceiling. They can often get away with one less coat of compound on the ceiling, like just do that feather coat. And then they spray the stipple uh, finish on it. Um, so it's primed and then they spray this um, stipple finish on it. Uh, often called uh, popcorn ceiling in a negative connotation. Uh, I can remember when this stuff first sort of came out, it was uh, everybody wanted it. And now I would say people don't want it. 
uh, trends and styles, they change, right? And who knows, in five years when they stop doing it, maybe everybody will want it. Uh, builders tend to charge you a little bit more if you want a smooth ceiling because then it's got to have that extra coat and a little bit more um, work done to it. So it's usually considered an extra. Uh, never used to be. It used to be an extra to put it and then it became an extra um, not to put it. Things change. <laughs> um, okay, so this is actually, these are pretty good details for all the components that we we're talking about, right? So you can pretty much figure out every terminology if you weren't clear on it. Um, so this is your door stop. This is what we call our door jams. Uh, this would be the head of the jam, the top, and this would be um, the side jam. They used to dado them in together. I can't say that I've seen that done in years, but um, they used to dado them or rabbit them. A rabbit is if it just gets cut off there, more likely. Uh, but um, either one, I don't, usually they're just butted and nailed from the edges and then there's shims put on either side and it doesn't like this and then it doesn't go anywhere when it's in place. So this is this in place, except at the top it would have the head. And um, you can see the shims in place uh, here. You can see the casing too. The casing does a lot to stiffen up the frame because you're nailing the casing. Uh, to the studs in the opening and you're nailing it to the jam. So where's the door going to go if it's nailed solidly and you have shims in key locations. Uh, so usually about four or five sets of shims going up the side of the door uh, that are in place. And the casing could be anywhere from about two and an eighth inches wide to like five or six inches wide. Uh, so depending on, you know, more the wider typically the more money you're you're spending although in contemporary designs they try to have things much more simple and clean lines and that sort of thing so it, it is a little bit different that way uh, and so then we have our baseboard at the at the the bottom um, and then we have usually what we would call a quarter round all right a quarter round so quarter round is usually exactly what it sounds like, a quarter of a round circle. You can get different profiles for um, quarter round. What that's really doing is it's filling the gap. Like if you've got a hardwood floor, remember we talked about shrinkage? Well, you see how this shows the hardwood going right tight there? Not a good idea. Um, the hardwood floor should actually stop about a good half an inch um, from the actual drywall. Uh, half an inch to three quarters of an inch is fine, all right? that would be good. I don't want to have it tight to the drywall because remember it could expand. I want to leave a little bit of room for it to expand. If I don't leave any room for it to expand in case the humidity goes up, it'll buckle somewhere in the middle. It's going to push, put pressure and it's going to buckle. So we, this gives us a lot of flexibility. Then we got the thickness of the base where we got the thickness of the cord around so that um, any gap is easily covered with this. And this it should be um, from this perspective, it should be nailed downwards into the floor. So that if the floor shrinks or moves up and down, it um, just slides along uh, the baseboard. And ideally, I find that the quarter round should be, if it's a hardwood floor, should be stained the same as the hardwood floor. If it gets knocked, uh, knocked around or if there's shrinkage, um, then it moves with it and it's stained. It doesn't show it the same way as if you had it painted and then it cracks along this line, the paint line. So a little bit on that. Now we get into cabinetry. Um, kitchens are kitchens and bathrooms are where the most money is spent in a house. Um, so it makes sense that there would be a set of shop drawings done for the cabinetry. Um, there are a lot of things that we consider with kitchen design when we're designing um, kitchens. And there's a lot of principles, the NKBA, National Kitchen and Bath Association. They have a lot of um, design guidelines for uh, designers of kitchens. And it really, it's a specialty onto itself. There's people that that's all they do is they design kitchens. And kitchens can cost, you know, the cabinetry in a kitchen uh, can cost anywhere from about for a, kitchen, a set of kitchen cabinets, um, maybe seven or eight thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand. Like you can, you you'd be surprised what you can spend on cabinetry in a kitchen, and um, so there's quite a big spread uh, on cost and that sort of thing. There are some cabinet manufacturers that are really really high end. I can remember I had a client one time, and this is a long time ago. Okay. 
So, and it was Downsview Kitchens. And I had my own cabinet manufacturer. It was very good, but wasn't crazy expensive. And it was a white lacquer um, cabinet, uh, raised panel. So there was nothing too over the top about it. And I, I got this, the specifications called for Downs, Downsview Kitchens, very high end manufacturer, still around, still very high end. And I remember the price was around $42,000 for the cabinets. All right, so $42,000 for the cabinets. And we are talking like almost 30 years ago, right? 42,000, 30 years ago, 42,000, 32. So that's where you see I'm getting my numbers from. It would be like 100,000 today. Um, and uh, the uh, my manufacturer could have done it for around 23,000. So I told the client, I thought this was a great thing. I, you know, I could pretty much uh, get it uh, almost half price. A client said, oh, no, 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 no. It's got to be Downsview Kitchens. So it's kind of like you find a car and, you know, one's a Mercedes and um, uh, one's a Toyota. Both these cars, they're going to get you from A to B and they're going to do what you need to do. But one's a Mercedes and one's a Toyota. And so um, you'll get that with clients. And um, that's fine. That's that's if that's what they want that's what you have to give them and um, you have to kind of think on those terms when you're when you're working in these areas like um, cabinetry and um, like this is a very simple bathroom vanity like this is not an expensive vanity right straight's kind of a stock um, shelf one probably um, probably about a six foot vanity. I'm looking at the tile. I think those are 12 inch tiles. So I'll just there looks like the middle. So it's about a six foot sort of standard vanity laminate countertop that doesn't even look like it's pre finished to me. So I don't know. Um, so that probably would not be very expensive, right? It'd be okay. It's nice. It's clean raised panels and all that. And it'll look nice when it's finished, but it's, it's not the other. So it just, if you have a client, they may want something that is a certain way and you have to make sure that you give it them, give it to them that way. In this case, this is from this drawing. It looks pretty much exactly like the drawing. Like there's not much that's not there. See the outlet that's there. We talked about um, duplex receptacles, one, two. So that's a duplex receptacle. It's close to a sink in a bathroom. So it'll have a GFI, ground fault, GFCI, ground fault circuit interrupter in it. Um, and you can kind of see there it is. And that's why it's saying 1,070 from the floor. So that's the distance from the floor um, to the outlet. Um, so these kind of uh, informations from the drawings get transferred around. You got the tile coming up the back on the bathtub. Um, if, if this was still in it, it would be saying that the tile has to come up around, I think it says 10 inches high or something around the edge of the bathtub, which it does. So pretty much everything is being followed um, in accordance with the drawings and plans, which is good. There's your baseboard at the bottom here. I think there's too much glare there to see um, the casing around the window, um, but um, that's um, giving you a good indication. But getting back to what I was saying, uh, give the client what they want. The other thing is in a production building like this one, uh, the clients generally, they get to go into a decor center. And so if they go into the decor center, they can look at the decor center and um, tribute the the builder in this case they would have had um, choices and there would have been upgrades so if the client thought well i just don't want a base model because this is probably what came with the house i want a granite countertop with a sink and uh, under cabinet sink or what have you and i'd like to have you know maybe white lacquer door they would probably have a, a series of choices they don't have a gazillion choices they pick different ones that they can have enough selection that the client will will like. And then you try to pick ones that um, will be uh, selected because they want uh, to just offer a few and they offer, the ones they want to offer, they want to offer good choices. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, in, in the core center and that sort of thing set up, there's a lot of thought processes that goes into that. I know uh, Madame Homes, they would really research things. And the other thing they would also look at there's a lot of research on if you give people too many choices, it it causes too much confusion. It, it stresses them out, right? If you give them like a, a hundred choices, they're all stressed out. You give them four choices, it's not as stressful, right? Um, so that's part of the process. And the other process, they want to make sure whatever they're giving them as a choice 
they can get easily, that they're not going to be delayed getting, that there's plenty of stock of it, right? That's the other thing. And you don't want to disappoint a client by saying, yeah, we can get you this. And then two weeks later, you're following, oh, they're out of stock. Um, they're generally pretty conscious that they have selections that they can readily get from their suppliers, especially when you're big um, builders like Tribute or Madame. You have a, a lot more control over the supply chain that way. Well, control, maybe a, a too much of a word, influence, influence. Um, on the supply chain. Getting back to what I was saying earlier, though, um, brings back a story that I had. Uh, sometimes these things resonate and you remember them. Uh, but I, I remember when I was a kid, so we used to make cabinets. Uh, my dad had a shop. It was actually a quite a big shop that was connected um, behind uh, where we used to live. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do those things today. But anyways, um, and um, he had this uh, German craftsman that used to work for him and his name was Gunther. And I used to work with Gunther a lot, but Gunther was a very stubborn kind of guy, um, but he was a nice guy. He was a nice guy to work with, uh, but um, he had certain certain beliefs about way certain things had to be done because however he was trained, it was probably pretty, you shall do it this way and this is what's correct and you must do it the correct way. And he was pretty much a master at his um, trade. So he could he could get a, people that were kind of masters at their trades, um, they could get away with a lot more with my dad um, than ones that weren't. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so uh, anyways, uh, this client, um, back then we used to have this French provincial molding. You've probably seen it. And you know, you go to Versailles and France and things, you see it all over the place. It's like this French provincial molding. That's what we used to put on the front of doors. All these little moldings, French provincial. And you could buy them pre-done and with the curves and then you just have to cut them and fit them. And so I remember there was a whole kitchen of cabinet doors and we had cut them out before uh, and Gunther was going to put all these moldings on the doors. And my dad said to Gunther, Gunther, the client does not want the French provincial moldings this way. The client actually wants them reversed. So they're curved that way. So instead of having them traditional, wanted them curved outward not inward. And Gunther goes, Simon, it's not right. You have to put it this way. And my dad goes, I don't care which way you have to put it. The client wants it this way. The client is paying for it. So we're going to put it this way. Simon, it's not right. I don't care if it's not right, Gunther. You got to put them this way. Anyway, so we went and um, uh, we had a job to do and we came back maybe around two or three o'clock and there's Gunther. And he's got all the doors, all the doors with it that way. So that was not good. Um, so you know who ended up on a Saturday changing them all? Me and my dad recut the doors and we had to re-change them. Um, some people say, well, why didn't he fire Gunther? Well, Gunther was too good at what he did, right? So um, just uh, a lesson learned. You're not going to make somebody really uh, change it. But if, you, if a client wants it a certain way, you give it that way unless it's against a building code or other regulatory requirement. And we talked about regulatory requirements. So that's a defining factor. But other than that, aesthetics, you know, whatever the client wants, the client gets, right? Because um, they're paying um, the bills for it. Something to remember because I'm going to mention kitchen design. And like I said, the National Kitchen and Bath Association, they have a triang the triangle layout. And the triangle is... Um, the layout triangle is based on the sink, the stove, and the fridge. And so an ideal layout for ergonomics of working in a kitchen, if you're a chef, what they found in their research over the years is this triangle design, triangle layout. And if you do that, it'll be a much more efficient, easy to do um, kitchen. And certain things they'll have like, don't put a stove under a window. Well, you got curtains and stuff, it's going to catch fire, but it's it's still not placed right. If you can have, if, if possible, where you've got the kitchen sink, have a window in front of it because people get bored. They can look out the window while they're doing dishes. Let's light in so you can see what you're doing. Um, so there's these, these kind of rules that you try to work into your design to see if um, they actually work. They've got a lot more than these. Like you can uh, there's thick books that you can get that are on kitchen design and that sort of thing. I used to go through them sometimes with clients with different ideas and different things. And of course, you want to place the dishwasher close as possible to the sink, right? You don't want to be 
going far from one spot to the next, it should be right next to the sink. So you look at those um, kind of uh, things and you're thinking about how the groceries will be loaded. If you're look ordering a fridge, you're making sure that it opens the right way um, and um, that there's some counter space beside the fridge so you can put stuff to load the fridge. So you have to really sort of be thinking about uh, those things. You try to have enough counter space that you can do some work on it without having it too broken up. Um, you try to have refrigerators at the end of a cabinet run or a pantry at the end of a cabinet run. And, um, but just remember their guidelines. Uh, I say that jokingly because um, when we moved into our last house about 10 years ago, um, it was actually a house uh, that was, um, it was actually uh, bequeathed in a charity to the Bob Rumble Center. And so we took it, took the house over and um, it was kind of lucky because it was run down and uh, gutted most of the house and redid, redid a few rooms, took out a number of walls and put in skylights and a bunch of different things. Um, but when I, I had this idea of how I was going to design the, the kitchen and I had this nice layout and everything all sort of figured out. And my wife looked at it and goes, no, I don't want the fridge there. I want the fridge here and I want this there and I want this there. What does the client want? Give the client what they want. So all these points here, some of them, uh, there's no triangle. Mine's in a straight line, the sink, the stove and the refrigerator. Um, so it's different. It's not the same as the um, recommendations. That's fine. You give the client what they want. And you know what? In fairness, I think as far as looks go, aesthetics, uh, it probably is the um, nicest looking kitchen that way. Uh, I don't think it's the most efficient, but I think it's uh, the nicest when people come over. It looks kind of more open and better that way. So um, who's right and who's wrong? Who's right and who's wrong? Well, who's going to use it the most and who, who wants to have the most influence on the design? I would say that's who's right. So you got to look at that from the client's point of view. You're going to be dealing with clients. You got to figure out, put yourself in their shoes, look at it from their position. So uh, that um, uh, famous uh, uh, book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Big part of it is trying to look at it from the other person's uh, viewpoint. And they want something different. They don't want French provincial. They want something that looks a little different. Nobody else is doing that. If that's what they want give it to them. If you're not sure, maybe do a mock-up of one door, show it to them. Is this what you want? You sure? Yes. Okay, fine. We're a go. Um, so those are things that you can um, do that way. And to be honest, I was using this um, BIM software at the time that did a 3D layout. So I was able to do the layouts my way and my wife's way. And we were able to take a, a look at it from any position in the room. And she definitely liked the, um, the other uh, the one that she selected. So, and we had a couple of, of minor changes that we made, went back and forth on and it came out okay. So guidelines, uh, National Kitchen and Bath Association, not building code, that is. So that's where you got some flexibility. Building code's different, you gotta do it. Um, so yeah, you could, and any kitchen, uh, I think pretty much any, uh, worth its salt, you should be able to get a three-dimensional drawing done of it. You know, even you go to Home Depot, uh, they'll do up a three-dimensional drawing for you. Um, you go to Ikea, you can go online and draw your own uh, three-dimensional kitchen with their units. And it not only is it uh, BIM as far as three-dimensional, and you can look at it from any direction, it's also giving you the costing uh, for all the cabinets. So it's kind of cool that way. Um, so there's a lot of different um, ways that you can um, view it and do it right like so here's we're looking at that same kitchen here and so we can see the island better when we look at a bird's eye view and remember there's like it's a perspective view so it's looking down it's giving a realistic um, view of the software and then this is more your traditional of the same thing your floor plan right and then this is looking at the cabinets because this is using what we call european style design and to be honest, in North America, we don't do North American design anymore. We haven't done North American design since I was a kid, practically, where we do what we call face frame and you'd have big cabinets and you build the face frame on it. We used to do that. I know how to do that pretty easily. Um, but because it's too big, it's too awkward, this can be built into components. It can be knocked down components. It can be put together on site. It can be standardized, it can be shipped uh, from a factory in the U.S., um, 
uh, to here. Uh, it can be assembled by assemblers in small plants. Small plants can just build their own carcasses. A carcass is just like one uh, framework of the cabinet. And then they just go together. And then what you have is filler pieces that go between cabinets to make it work out to exact sizes. Because they might have stock sizes like a standard 36 inch wide cabinet, but then they might have two inch filler pieces that go between them if you need to make some adjustments. So you can pretty much adjust in or out to any size. And the, the filler pieces, often called scribes when they go against a wall, can also be tapered if you run into a problem where one of the walls is not perfectly plumb. Uh, we talked about wood moving and things of that nature. Um, kitchens, I would be doing really careful frame checks. Remember we talked about frame checks in the framing section to make sure that if it's a new build, it should be level, it should be plumb, it should be square uh, within a pretty good to small tolerance. Um, Renovation is another story. You have to deal with um, the cards you're dealt and then that's where scribes and things can offer you an opportunity to adjust things so that you've got a square cabinet, your doors have to be installed plumb, but if the wall's a little bit crooked, you'll see a little bit of a taper on the piece against the wall. So then you've got elevations. So you're seeing all this stuff here, right? Uh, kind of all the stuff that we've been talking about through the course, sort of a BIM three-dimensional drawing, uh, bird's eye view, perspective looking down, uh, just a floor plan with your cabinets, elevations with the cabinets. And these are basically shop drawings for the kitchen cabinets. These are how these cabinets are going to be put together based on the manufacturer's requirements for them. So you can see how they go together. And um, that is uh, every set of kitchen cabinets will have a set of shop drawings done for the kitchen, right? So this is looking at that without the island in front of it. And now you can see the cabinets um, sort of um, lined up amongst each other. And so you can see these filler pieces that they've got these decorative um, columns on them. Um, so that's giving you a sense of uh, what it, um, would, a really good sense of the elevation, what it would look like, but the three dimensional views um, gives you a really good idea. And then you, this you could rotate and look at different views. And a lot of them, they'll have different colorings and for the different colors that you might be thinking about for your uh, kitchen, etc., you can you can go the whole nine yards on a lot of them. Um, so going to uh, an example in the Doncaster drawings that came with your textbook, uh, this is showing a set of ca kitchen cabinets. Now, is that going to be exactly like that? Again, the client usually can go in the decor center and you give them certain options. So they might have some options that they could choose from. Uh, maybe instead of the micro shelf there, put it somewhere else. Um, but you know what? In this kitchen, it's actually a pretty good layout. Like if we talk about the design triangle, there's your fridge, there's your sink, there's your stove. It forms a perfect triangle. The length of the triangle would be well within what they describe because I think it's uh, 25 feet or 24 feet or less. This is way less than 24 feet if you measure the length of the three sides. And look at that, the dishwasher is right next to the sink. So that's a really good thing. The microwave is right next to the fridge. There's gonna be a counter underneath the microwave because the height of the microwave shelf is above there. So you're gonna have room that you can put some groceries if you're emptying the fridge out. Um, so I think it's overall, giving that particular space, um, a pretty good utilization of that space. Um, other than maybe where you want to put a bank of drawers, or maybe they don't uh, include a bank of drawers in the original one, maybe just single drawers, um, This it would probably come out pretty close to that. So you can sort of see how they've got this laid out. They're using a laminate countertop. So this is pretty uh, baseline kind of kitchen. There's your outlet. So that's why the outlet had to be up a certain amount. So 1500, you'd wanna make sure whatever you do that the cabinets that are ordered, the shop drawings, that the electrician is making sure that the outlets and everything works for the cabinets are, that are being ordered. Not necessarily these cabinets, the cabinets that have been ordered. That's great if they're exactly like these, then they'll work. But if they're not, you wanna make sure that you've made those adjustments because the cabinets go on when all of the drywall is done, right? And at least the prime coat is painted, if not the finished coat being painted, right? So if that's the case, um, 
you know, you don't want to be moving around outlets and breaking up open drywall and rerouting wires. You want them to be in the right spot. And you want to make sure the outlets are high enough that if there's any kind of splash or anything of that nature, it's not going to interfere with it. The other thing, you see how there's a, if I stood back and I'd taken a picture right back here, I probably could have got both sides of the casing. Um, in this case, it was done very well. Um, it was exactly even. So where this cabinet stopped, that space, I think it's about an inch and a quarter by the look of it. On the other side, if I recall, it was about it was about an inch and a quarter as well. You know, I wouldn't want it to be tight on one side and then, you know, um, different on the other if I could help it. I'd like it to be symmetrical so when I look at it, it looks like there was some planning done, some thought put into it. Um, so these are some of the things that you uh, think about from that perspective. I'm not sure I'm happy with uh, the way this sticks out beyond the bulkhead here, but it is because of the refrigerator. So I might have thought about extending the bulkhead out at this point to make it more rationalized in, in view. Um, there's these little things and bulkheads are another whole topic, right? Uh, sometimes bulkheads, everybody wants them. And then sometimes bulkheads, nobody wants them. It's a uh, it's like a, a trend thing. Um, like I said, nobody wants popcorn ceilings really, but maybe they take it because they have to pay extra and they're already mortgaging themselves, whatever. Um, bulkheads are one of those things where they're in trendy and then they're not trendy. What's been more trendy lately is to have cabinets at different heights, like have some that are higher than others. And so that there's a little bit of uh, more um, uh, different differing views and uh, more going on with the cabinetry, especially when you've got nine and 10 foot ceilings, more common now than eight foot ceilings. Uh, so those are some of the changes that you've seen take place because this is just kind of a standard eight foot ceiling. But if you've got a much higher ceiling, um, there's more sort of opportunity to have um, things, um, a mixed variety of things with your cabinets and your heights and things like that. Like traditionally a cabinet too is, um, usually it's going to be slightly less than 24 inches so slightly less than 24 inches that's so that you can use materials the materials that they build cabinets out of come out of four foot sheets so if i use a, a 24 inches like not quite like say 23 and a half um, then 23 and three quarters uh, then uh, i can use uh, two strips off of a sheet a four foot by eight foot sheet if my upper cabinets are 12 inches deep, which is traditionally, or like 11 and three quarters, then I can get four strips off of a sheet, right? Minus the saw curve. Uh, so that gives me um, a good utilization of materials. I don't have so much waste. So traditional cabinets kind of went along with that. Uh, counter height, pretty standard, around 36 inches for a kitchen uh, cabinet. So 36 inches. So usually your cabinet, your your cabinet here is usually around 35 um, and a quarter and then the counter is usually about three quarters of an inch thick and that usually get, puts you at about 36 inches and that gives you good height for your dishwasher and your stoves usually work out because you want to have them even on the top so things have to work out that's why they're standard that way um, so there are those those things that you will uh, see that um, occur pretty standard but um, sometimes they may have a section on a long one where you might have the upper one just stick out a little bit further for one unit, maybe 16 inches, um, that sort of thing. So there's a number of different, um, well, there's a number of standards and then there's a number of mixtures. And then also if you're building for people that are, uh, you want to provide barrier free access and wheelchair openings, there's, there's different designs that come in with that because that's probably too high. You can actually customize things that um, counters um, are at where the sink is as at a lowered um, portion and a wheelchair can move easily underneath it so the person can easily do the dishes. So there's other considerations that come into place when you start thinking about barrier free access. And at the end here, I put uh, masonry fireplace. Well, there's a lot, if it's the old style of fireplace uh, is a solid masonry fireplace. It was this behemoth. It would be quite expensive to do. It would have a chimney extend above the, um, above the roof. And uh, it would be sort of the focal point of the living room. Uh, I would say that most cases today, 
uh, in at least in urban centers like Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, New York, all these other places, uh, Chicago, um, direct vent gas fireplaces are very popular uh, because there's zero clearance. Uh, that means the, the unit can be just sat on top of the floor and then it can be built around with anything you want. You know, you want a big sort of precast concrete or limestone sort of unit built around it, you can do that. You want just sort of a wood facade, maybe with a marble surround around the edge here, you can do that as well. And then it just directly vents outside through the wall. Um, because it's a high efficiency, um, it doesn't put a lot of heat out because most of the heat is being um, converted inside. So that's why it's a very efficient fireplace. A traditional masonry fireplace is very inefficient. They're usually around somewhere between uh, 40% and maybe if you have an insert, you know, up to about 60% uh, efficient. Um, and you have to, and you have to go cut wood and you have to burn it. And, you know, people in the city, I don't see people in the city cutting wood. I see them buying wood, then I see them bringing the wood inside, and then I see everybody jumping on chairs when all the centipedes and bugs comes out of the wood. So I don't see that. Um, I see it in cottage country. I see it in, you know, people have chalets, and I'm in Collingwood right now, and these kind of places, I see that. But even then, I only see it as much when it's like you're outside the gas line availability, maybe. Um, so... Uh, it's kind of a, a, a technology that has kind of been taken over by um, gas, I would say. People like a remote. They sit and they click and then it lights up and then they're tired and they shut it off. That's how um, people tend to like it. You can have an, a, a fan in it too. This one does not have a fan. I don't... Uh, if I saw electric wire there, then I'd say it's got a fan. I don't see a, a, a supply line. If you put a fan, it really can heat up the place like... Um, really, without a fan, it'll still heat it up, but just not to the same um, extent. Maybe sometimes the fan is too hot, so, um, but very efficient uh, way of doing it. We've already done this in other uh, classes, so I'm not going to get into the door size referencing too much, other than just to quickly say, in this particular designer, they use a number, and then you go to the construction notes, and it will tell you the door size. So you go to number eight. And there's the door size, two foot four by six foot eight by inch and three eight. There's the number, number nine. Nine, it's an exterior door, that it is. There's your porch. Um, so it's going to be three foot. Outside doors are going to be wider. Probably the smallest you're going to find is two foot eight, two foot ten, three foot's even better. This is nice. That's uh, a nice entrance. Last thing you want in a design, in my opinion, is a door that is too small to get big things in it. And two foot eight, in my mind, is too small because by the time you have the rabbits on each side for the door, it's now two foot seven. So um, three foot door, that should be able to get most of what you want to get in. And then you got wide openings and that from there on should be good. Fridge refrigerators, for example, today, very often 34 inches like deep and um, some are 34 inches, 34 or slightly more deep and they're 36 inches wide hard to get in if your doors are too tight um, so uh, this is good or if you got a double door that you can open them both up even better so that's kind of what I wanted to cover on the interior finishes um, we're gonna get into more interior finishes but we're just gonna look at stairs uh, so we're gonna start to look at stair construction and stair layout and give you a little bit of the mathematics behind that in um, 9b and there'll be a follow-up one to that probably the following week where i'm going to get more into the calculations just to make sure everybody's pretty comfortable with the calculations on that this part here i think is pretty um straightforward i would say get a chance to look at some trim and moldings like don't look at home depot they don't have in my opinion very much as far as a, a huge cross selection they got the basics there but go you know take a look online at one of the um, trim uh, places at all the selections and what you can do and how you can really sort of um, jazz up a place uh, with um, different selections. Unless you're more the contemporary, then you're really looking for clean lines and uh, less um, trim, less casings. So it's all a matter of taste too. All right, so that's what I wanted to cover today. I hope everybody um, has a uh, wonderful day. And so Tom Stevenson signing off and I will see you next time. Bye for now.